The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I presume everyone has an urgent question to ask. <clears throat> Maybe I'll have to point to someone. There's one over there. I, oh, good. Just one more question. <coughs> that's exactly what you said. But you said that maybe like the cane lights are associated to the glia cells. Is that right? Oh, I don't want to speculate on how the brain works because, <laughs> <laughs> because there's this huge community of neuroscientists who write papers about, and they're very strange papers because they talk about how maybe it's not the neuron, and I just downloaded a long paper by someone whose name I won't mention about the idea that a typical neuron has 100,000 connections and so something awesomely important must go on inside the neuron body. And it's got all these little fibers and things. And presumably, if it's dealing with 100,000 signals or something, then it must be very complicated. So maybe the neuron isn't smart enough to do that. So maybe the other cells nearby that support the neurons and feed them and send chemicals to and fro around there, have something to do with it. How many of you have read such articles? Uh, it's a very strange community because um, I think the problem is that history of that science started, first there was the it was generally thought <clears throat> that all the neurons were connected. And then around 1890 was the first clear idea that nerve cells weren't arranged in a continuous network. Uh, I think it was generally believed that they were all connected to each other because as far as you could tell with the microscopes of the time, um, Um, it didn't show enough. And then the <laughs> hypothesis that the neurons are separate and there are little gaps called synapses, as far as I can tell, uh, started around the 1890s. And um, from then on, as far as I can see, neurology and psychology became more and more separate. And the uh, neurologists got obsessed with chemicals, hormones, epinephrine, and uh, there are about a dozen <clears throat> chemicals involved that, gets, that you can detect when parts of the brain are activated. And so uh, a whole bunch of folklore grew up over the, about the roles of these chemicals. And one thought of some chemicals as inhibitory and excitatory. And that idea still spreads, although uh, what we know about the nervous system now, and I think I mentioned this before, is that in general, if you trace a neural pathway from one part of the brain to another, what happens is that the connections tend to alternate not always, but frequently, so that this connection might inhibit this neuron, and then you look at the output of that neuron, and that might tend to excite neurons in the next brain center, and uh, then most of those cells will tend to inhibit. Uh, I mean, each brain center gets inputs from several others, and so it's not that a brain center is excitatory or inhibitory but the connections from one brain center to another tend to have this effect. And that's probably 
necessary from a systems dynamic point of view. Because if all neurons tended to either do nothing or excite the next brain center, then what would happen? Uh, as soon as you got a certain level of excitement, then more and more brain centers would get uh, activated and the whole thing would explode. And <clears throat> that's more or less what happens in an epileptic seizure, where if you get enough electrical and chemical activity of one kind or another, mostly electrical, I think, but I don't know, uh, then whole large parts of the brain start to fire synchronously and the thing spreads like a very much like a forest fire. So that's a long rant. Yeah. I guess I've repeated it several times, but it's hard to communicate with that community because they really want to find the secret of thinking and knowledge in the brain cells rather than in the architecture of the interconnections. So my inclination is to find an intermediate level uh, such as at least in the cortex which is what distinguishes the does it start in mammals? I think so. Uh, I think if I'm <laughs> rather than a neurology book I'm thinking of Carl Sagan's book which uh, there's a sort of triune theory that's very popular, which is that the brain consists of three major divisions. And the I forget what the lowest level one is called, but the middle level is sort of the amphibian and uh, and then uh, the mammalian. And it's in the mammalian <coughs> development that most of the, that large parts of the brain are cortex. And the cortex isn't so much like a tangled neural net, but it's divided mainly into columns. So, and each column, these vertical columns, tend to have six or seven layers. I think six is the standard. And the whole thing is what is it, about four millimeters, four or five millimeters thick, maybe a little more. And in each of these columns, there's, there's major columns which have about a thousand neurons, and one of these columns is made of maybe 10 or 20 of these mini columns that are have 50 or, uh, or 100 or whatever. And so, my inclination is to suspect that since these are the animals that think and plan many steps ahead and uh, do all the sorts of things we take for granted in humans, that we want to look there for the architecture of, of uh, memory and problem-solving systems. In the animals without <coughs> cortexes, you can account for most of their behavior in terms of fairly low level immediate stimulus response reflexes and large major states like turning on some parts of some big blocks of these reflexes when it's hungry and turn on other blocks when there's a environmental threat and so forth or, or whatever. Um, anyway. I forget what, yes? Um, so in chapter three, you talked about um, like the stages we go through. Well, we start from the I'm wondering how do you decide that we you know, transition from one stage to another? And why do we um, go through <coughs> stages of um, denial, bargaining, like frustration, depression, and then like um, only like the last stage seems productive? I guess like, my main question is how do we decide that we should transition from one stage to another? That's a beautiful question. Uh, 
I think it's fairly well understood in the invertebrates that there are different centers in the brain for different activities. And I'm not sure how much is, how much is known about how these things switch. Uh, how does an animal decide whether it's time to, for example, most animals are either diurnal or nocturnal. So some stimulus uh, comes along like it's getting dark and a nocturnal animal uh, might then start waking up and it turns on some part of the brain and it uh, turns off some other parts and it starts to sneak around looking for food or whatever it does at night. Whereas a, diurn a daily animal, <clears throat> uh, when it starts to get dark, that might trigger uh, some brain center to turn on and it looks for its place to sleep and goes and hides. So some of these are due to external things. And then of course there are internal clocks. So uh, for lots of animals, if you put it in a box that's dimly illuminated um, and it has a 24 hour cycle of some sort, it might persist in that cycle for for quite a few days and go to sleep every 24 hours for half the time and so on. A friend of mine once decided he would, he would see about this and it's a famous uh, AI theorist named Ray Solomonoff and he um, put black paint on all his windows and found that he had a 25 or 26 hour natural cycle, which was very nice. And uh, this persisted for several months. Uh, I had another friend who lived in the New York subways because his, his apartment was in a building that had an entrance to the subway and he stayed uh, out of daylight for six months. But uh, anyway, he too uh, found that he preferred to be on a 25 or 26 hour a day than 24. <coughs> I'm rambling, but uh, so uh, we apparently have several different systems. So there's dead reckoning system where some internal clocks are regulating your behavior and then uh, there are other systems where your people are very much affected by the amount of light and uh, so forth. So we probably have four or five ways of doing almost everything that's important and uh, then people get various disorders where some of these systems fail and a person uh, doesn't have a regular sleep cycle and um, there are disorders where uh, people fall asleep. What's it called when, when you fall asleep every few minutes? Narcolepsy. Narcolepsy and uh, all sorts of wonderful disorders just because the brain has evolved so many uh, different ways of doing anything that's very important. Yeah. Uh, can you describe like the best piece of criticism for the Society of Mind Theory? Best piece of what? The best criticism. Oh. <laughs> it, it reminds me of an article I recent read about. Um, the possibility of a virus for, what's the disorder where? Alzheimer's? No, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually the, there isn't any uh, generally accepted cause for Alzheimer's uh, as far as I know. Is it, well, what? They just did the experiment where they injected Alzheimer's infected matter into someone and they got the same plaque. Oh, well. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I wonder if that's 
a popular theory. No, what's the one where people... Uh, fibromyalgia. Say it again. Fibromyalgia. Yes, right. That's right, which is not recognized by most theorists to be a definite disease. Uh, but uh, there's been an episode in which somebody, I forget what her name is, uh, was pretty sure that she had found a virus for it. And um, every now and then somebody uh, revives that theory and uh, tries to get more evidence for it. Anyway, uh, there must be disorders where the programming is bad rather than uh, a biochemical disorder because uh, whatever the brain is, it's, it's uh, the adult brain is certainly uh, has a very large component of what we would, in any other case, consider to be software. Namely, lots of things that you've learned, including ways for one part of the brain to discover how to modulate or turn on or turn off other parts of the brain. And uh, since we're only, we've only had this kind of cortex for four or five million years, it's probably still got lots of bugs. Evolution never knows what, when, it, when you make a new innovation, you don't know what's going to come after that that might uh, find bugs and ways to get short range advantages, short term advantages at the expense of longer term advantages. So lots of mental diseases might be software bugs. Uh, and a few of them are known to be connected to, uh, you know, um, abnormal secretions of chemicals and so forth. But even in those cases, it's hard to be sure that the overproduction or underproduction of a neurologically important chemical uh, is a, uh, what should I call it, a biological disorder or a functional disorder because some part of the nervous system might have found some trick to cause um, abnormal secretions of, of some substance. That's the sort of thing that we can expect to learn a great deal more about in the next generation because of the lower cost and greater resolution of, of brain scanning techniques and what's his name the and new synthetic ways of of uh, putting in fluorescent chemicals into a normal brain without injuring it much uh, so that you can now do sort of macrochemical experiments of seeing what chemicals are uh, being secreted in the brain uh, with new kinds of scanning techniques so uh, neuroscience is going to be very exciting in the next generation with all the great new instruments. As you know, my complaint is that somehow introduction to the, I'm not saying any of the present AI theories have been confirmed to, to tell you that the brain works as such and such a rule-based system or such and such a, or use uh, Winston-type representations or Roger Shank-type representations or scripts or frames or whatever. And the uh, next to last chapter of the emotion machine sort of summarizes, I think, uh, almost a dozen different um, AI theories of, of ways to represent knowledge. Uh, nobody has confirmed that any of those particular ideas are, uh, represent what happens in a mammalian brain. Uh, and the problem is that the, to me, is that the neuroscience community just doesn't read that stuff and doesn't design experiments to, to look for them. David has been 
moving from computer science and AI into, uh, into that. So he's, he's my current source of knowledge about what's happening there. Have any of you been following contemporary neuroscience? That's strange. Yeah. So uh, you will talk about software a little bit. Like, so they, I think they, they used to like analyze Einstein brain and realize like that's why I talk about the glia cells. And maybe like they, he had a lot of like a lot more glia cells than than normal humans. And uh, so, do you believe that uh, the intelligence of humans is like more on the software side or on the hardware side? Like, we have computers that are very, very powerful. Could we create software that, like, we can run these machines that we produce in, uh, like, humans? Like, yeah. I don't see any uh, reason to doubt it. Computers can simulate anything. Uh, what they can't do yet, I suppose, is simulate large scale quantum phenomena because uh, if you know the, the Feynman theory of quantum mechanics, is that uh, if you have a network of physical systems that are connected, then it's in the nature of physics that whatever happens from one state to another uh, in the real universe, uh, whatever happens actually happens by the wave function. The wave function represents the sum of, of the activities propagating through all possible paths. So in some sense, uh, that's, that's too exponential to simulate on a computer. In other words, we can, uh, I believe the, the biggest supercomputers can simulate a helium atom today fairly well, but they can't simulate a lithium atom because it's sort of four or five layers of exponentiation. It's between two to the two to the two to the two and four to the four to the four to the four. It gets, uh, those numbers get out of hand. But I suspect that the reason the brain works is that it's evolved to prevent quantum effects from uh, making things complicated. The reason, the great thing about a neuron is that generally speaking, <coughs> A neuron fires all or none, and you get this point. You have to get a, a full half volt of uh, potential between the neuron's uh, fiber <coughs> and the surrounding fluid. And that's a half a volt is a, a big <coughs> uh, yeah. So, like, do you believe that the software that we have right now is equivalent to, for example, uh, the intelligence that we have like in dogs or, for example, simple animals? Is like the difference that, like, do we just need to implement the software, like modify the software, or somehow we need to create a whole different software that no, so, there doesn't seem to be much difference in the architecture of, in the local architecture of. Turn your microphone on. The one on the bottom. Oh, can I turn it off? Yes. It's not green. Yes, yeah, so throw, throw the switch. Is it green now? Now it's green. Okay, good. Um, the difference between the dog and a person is the, the huge frontal cortex. Uh, I think the rest of it is fairly similar. And I presume the hippocampus and amygdala and the structures that control which parts of the cortex are used for what 
are somewhat different. But the, the small details of the all mammalian brains are practically the same. I mean, basically, you can't, you can't make a, an early genetic change in how neurons work, or all the brain cells of the offspring would be somewhat different, and the thing would be dead. So evolution has this property that generally there are only two places in the development of an embryo that evolution can uh, operate, namely in the pre-placental stage. You can change the way the egg, egg breaks up and evolves, and you can have amazing things like identical twins happen without any effect on the nature of the adult offspring. Or you can change the things that happen most recently in evolution, like uh, little tweaks in how uh, some part of the nervous system works, uh, if it doesn't change earlier stages. What you, however, mutations that operate in the middle of all that and change the number of segments in the embryo, I guess you could have a longer tail or a shorter tail, and that won't affect much. But if you change the, the 12 segments of the spine that the brain develops from, you'd get a huge alteration in the, how that animal will think. So we're sort of, in other words, evolution cannot change intermediate structures very much, or uh, the animal won't live. Bob Lohler. One thinks of comparing a person to a dog, would it not be most appropriate to think of those persons who were like the wild boy of southern France who, who grew up in the woods without any language? I would say that if you're going to look at an individual's intelligence, that would be a fair comparison with a dog. Whereas what we have when we think of people today is people who have learned so much through interaction with other people that the transmission of culture is it not essentially ways of thinking that have been learned throughout the history of civilization and some of us are able to pass on to others? Uh, sure, uh, although uh, if you expose a dog to humans, it doesn't learn language. So, uh, may or may not come. <laughs> right. So there, but presumably language, uh, is fairly recent. So you could have mutations in the uh, structure of of the language centers, and still have a human that's alive, and it might be better at language than most other people, or somewhat worse. So you could have lots of small mutations in anything that's been recently evolved. But, uh, but the frontal cortex is, uh, and the, the human cortex is, is really very large compared to the rest of the brain. Uh, same in dolphins and a couple of other animals, I forget. Whales, yeah. Why I ask that is that it seems to me that we have some quality, like some kind of, we can see the world, like add some qualities to the world. And like this is what I would call consciousness. And like for me, it seems that dogs also have this quality of like uh, seeing the world and like adding qualities to the world. So like maybe all, uh, this is good, this is bad, like there are different qualities for different uh, beings. And like the software that we produce right now seems to be maybe faster and like maybe do more tasks than what maybe a dog does. But uh, for me, it doesn't seem that it has essentially this like quality uh, thing. <coughs> like, it doesn't have consciousness in the sense, it doesn't like aggregate the quality to the things in the world, maybe. Well, 
I think I know what you're getting at, but uh, <coughs> but you're using that word consciousness, which uh, which I've decided to abandon because because it's 36 different things, and probably uh, a dog has five or six of them, or 31. I don't know, but. Uh, One question is, do you think a dog can think several steps ahead and consider two alternative That's funny. Oh, let's make this abstract. So here here's a world and the dog is here, and it wants to get here, and there are all sorts of obstacles in it. So can the dog say, well, if I went this way, uh, I'd have such and such difficulty, whereas if I went this way, I'd have this difficulty. Well, I think this one looks better. Do you think your dog considers two or three alternatives and makes plans? I have no idea, but... <coughs> Uh, the curious thing about a person is uh, you can decide that you're going to not uh, not act in the situation until you've considered 16 plans. And then one part of your brain is making these different uh, approaches to the problem. And, and another part of your brain is saying, well, now I've made five plans and I'm beginning to forget the first one. So... Uh, I better reformulate it and you're doing all of these self-conscious in the sense that uh, you're making plans that involve predicting what decisions you will make and instead of making them you make the decision to say I'm going to follow out these two plans and uh, use the result of that to decide which one to do you think a dog does any of that? Does it look around and say, well, I could go that way or this way? Hmm. I remember our dog was good at, uh, if you throw a ball, it would go and get it. And if you threw two balls, it would go and get both of them. And sometimes if you threw three balls, it would uh, go and get them all. And sometimes if a ball would roll under a couch that it couldn't reach. It would get the other two, and it would think, and then it would run back to the kitchen where that ball is usually found, and then it would come back disappointed. So what does that mean? Did it have parallel plans, or uh, does it make a new one when the previous one fails, and they're not actually parallel? What's your guess? How far ahead does a dog think? Do you have a dog? Yeah, I do have a dog, but like, I don't believe that's the essential part of like beings that have some kind of advanced brain. Like we can plan ahead, humans can plan ahead. I don't think <coughs> the, the like the core the fundamental part of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like humans, uh, I think Winston says that humans are better than primates in like they can understand stories and they can join together stories. But somehow uh, I like, I don't buy the story that uh, primates are just like uh, room planners. Like, I believe somehow we can, we have some uh, quality machine of the world and like somehow we're not writing a software. <coughs> but you know, it's funny, uh, computer science teaches us things that, that weren't obvious before. Like it might turn out that <coughs> if you're a computer and you only have two registers, 
then, well, in principle, you could do anything, but that's, that's another matter. Uh, but it might turn out that maybe a dog has only two registers and a person has four. And a trivial thing like that makes it possible to have two plans and put them in suspense and think about the strategy and come back and change one. Whereas if you only had two registers, uh, your mind would be much lower order. And there's no big difference. So computer science tells us that the usual way of thinking about abilities might be wrong. Before computer science, people didn't really have that kind of idea. Uh, many years ago, I was in a contest. I mean, you know, a science. Because uh, some of our friends showed that you could make a universal computer with four registers. And uh, <clears throat> I had discovered some other things. and. I managed to uh, show that you could make a universal computer with just two registers. And uh, that, that was a big surprise to a lot of people. But there, wasn't, there, aren't anything in, there never was anything in the history of psychology uh, of that nature. So there never were really technical theories of, of, it's really computational complexity. What does it take to solve certain kinds of problems? And until the 1960s, there weren't any theories of that. And I'm not sure that uh, that aspect of computer science has actually reached many uh, psychologists or neuroscientists. I'm not even sure that it's relevant, but it's it's really interesting that the difference between two and three registers could make an exponential difference in how fast you could solve certain kinds of problems and not others. So maybe there'll be a little more mathematical psychology in the next couple of decades. Yeah. So in artificial intelligence, how much of the effort should be, um, how much of our effort should be devoted to like kind of reflecting on our own thinking as humans and trying to figure out what's really going on inside our brains and then trying to kind of implement that versus uh, observing and identifying what kinds of problems we as humans can solve and then come up with any sort of way for a computer to uh, kind of in a human-like way solve these problems. Well, there are a lot of nice questions. I don't think... <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to say, uh, to suggest that we think about what's happening in our brains because uh, that takes scientific instruments. But <clears throat> it certainly makes sense to go over older theories of psychology and ask uh, what kinds of procedures uh, To solve a certain kind of problem, what kind of procedures are absolutely necessary? And you could find some things like that, like, like how many registers would you need and what kinds of conditionals and uh, what kind of addressing. Um, so I think a lot of cognitive psychology, modern cognitive psychology, is, is of that character. But uh, I don't see any way to introspect and well enough to, to guess how your brain does something because uh, we're just not that conscious. You don't have access to... You could think for 10 years about how do I think of the next word to speak and uh, unlikely that you would you might get some new ideas about how this might have happened. In fact, uh, but you couldn't be sure. Well, I take it back. Probably people 
you could probably get some correct theories by being lucky and clever. And then you'd have to find a neuroscientist to uh, design an experiment to see if there's any evidence for that. In particular, I'd like to convince some neurologists to <coughs> consider the idea of K-lines. That's um, described, I think, in both of my books. And uh, think, of, think of experiments to see if you could get them to light up or uh, otherwise localize. And uh, once you have in your mind the idea that maybe the way one brain connects, sends information to another is over something like K-lines, which uh, I think I talked about that the other day. Random superimposed coding on parallel wires. Then maybe you could think of experiments that uh, even present brain scanning techniques could use to, to <coughs> localize these. Uh, my main concern is that uh, the way they do brain scanning now is to set thresholds to see which brain centers light up uh, and which go turn off. And then they say, oh, I see this activity looks like it happens in the lateral hippocampus because you see that light up. I think that there should be an, at least a couple of uh, neuroscientist groups who do the opposite, which is to reduce the contrast and when there are several brain centers that seem to be involved in an activity, then say something to the patient and look for one area to get 2% dimmer and another to look 4% brighter and say, that might mean that there's a K line going from this one to that one with an inhibitory effect on this or that. Uh, but as far as I know right now, Every paper I've ever seen published showing brain centers lighting up has high contrast. And so they're missing all the small things. And maybe, maybe they're only seeing the end result of the process where a little thinking has gone on with all these intricate, uh, low intensity interactions. And then the thing decides, oh, OK, I'm going to do this. And you conclude that that brain center which lit up is the one that decided to do this. Whereas it's the result of a very small, fast avalanche. Have you seen the one a couple of weeks ago about reading out the visual in real time? So From the visual cortex? Yes. Quite a nice hack. They aren't actually reading out the visual field. They, for each subject, they do a massive amount of training where they flash Picture. thousands of one second video clips and assemble a database of uh, very small perforations in different parts of the visual cortex lighting up. And then they, they show a novel video to each of the subjects and uh, basically uh, just do a linear combination of all of the videos that they had done in the training phase weighted by how closely uh -huh. uh, things line up in the brain. And you can, you can sort of see what's going on. It's, it's quite striking. Can you tell what they're thinking? Or you th can only tell what they're seeing. Um, and, but I think... Yeah, if your eyes are closed, what is your... Your primary visual cortex probably doesn't do anything, does it? I think it's just... <coughs> yeah. But the secondary one might be representing things that you that might be there. Yes. So the, the goal of the authors of this paper is eventually to literally make movies out of dreams. But that's a long way off. It's an old idea in science fiction. Mm -hmm. How many of you read science fiction? Wow. That's a majority. Who's the best new writer? Neil Stevenson. He's been writing a long time. New compared to High Life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
as I had dinner with Stevenson at the Hillises a couple of years ago. Yeah. One last question. So, from what I understood, it seems that you're you're saying that the difference between us and like, for example, dogs, is just a confrontation of uh, like power. So, do you believe that the difference between dogs and computers is also just computational? Like, what 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 would be the difference between dogs and like Turing machine. Like, <coughs> well, there is no difference. It's just. It might be that only humans and maybe some of their closest relatives can imagine a sequence. In other words, the the simplest, oldest theories in psychology were uh, the theory of like David Hume, had the idea of association. One idea in the mind or brain would, uh, <coughs> causes another idea to appear in another. So that means that uh, a brain that's learned associations or learn if-then rule-based systems can make chains of things. But the question is, uh, can any animal other than humans, imagine two different situations and then compare them and say, if I did this and then that, how would the result differ from doing that and then this? If you look at Jerry Sussman's thesis, if you're at MIT, a good thing to do is to read the, and you're taking a course, you should read the PhD thesis of your professor. Uh, it not only will help you understand better uh, what the professor said, uh, you'll get a higher grade if you care and uh, uh, many other advantages. Like you'll actually be able to talk to him and his mind won't throw up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know if a dog can recapitulate as, can the dog think, I think I'll go around this fence and when I get to this tree, I'll do this, I'll pee on it. That's what dogs do. And then I'll, uh, whereas if I go this way, something else will happen. It might be that you, uh, that pre, pre, uh, Primates can't do much of that. On the other hand, I sus if you ask, what is, the, what is the song of the whale? Uh, what's the whale that has this 20-minute song? Uh, I think my conjecture is that, uh, you know, a whale has to swim a 1,000 miles or several hundred miles sometimes to get the food it wants, because things change. And uh, each group of whales, <coughs> humpback whales, I guess, sing this song that's about 20 minutes long. And nobody has made a good conjecture <coughs> about what's the content of that song. But it's shared among the animals, and it goes you know, they can hear it 20 or 50 miles away and repeat it. And it changes every season. So I suspect that the obvious thing that it should be about is where's the food these days? Where are the best flocks of fish to eat? Because a whale can't afford to swim 200 miles uh, uh, to the place where the, the, its favorite fish were last year and find it empty. It takes a lot of energy to to cross the ocean. So maybe those animals have the ability to remember very long sequences and even some semantics connected with it. I don't know if dogs have anything like that. 
do dogs ever seem to be talking to each other? Or are they just? Not all dogs, but a very small fraction of the stray dogs um, in the in the city have learned how to ride the metro. <coughs> um, they live out in the suburbs because I guess people give them less trouble when mm -hmm. they're out in the suburbs. And then they take the subway each day oh. into the city center where there are more people. And they have various strategies for begging in the city center. <laughs> so for instance, they find some guy with a sandwich and they bark really loudly behind the guy and the guy would drop the sandwich and then they'd steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Or they have a pack of them, and they all know each other, and they send out a really cute one to beg for food, and so they'll give the cute one food, and the cute one brings it back to everyone else. And simply navigating the subway is actually a bit complicated for a dog, um, but somehow like a very small group of dogs in Moscow have learned how to do it, like figure out where their stop is, get on, get off. <laughs> yeah, our dog once stopped on the green line, and got off at Park Street, <clears throat> so she was missing for a while, and somebody at Park Street called up and said, your dog is here. So I went down and got her. <clears throat> and the, the agent said, you know, we had a dog that came to Park Street every day and changed trains and took the red line to somewhere. And finally, we found out that its master had, it used to go to work with its owner every day, and he died. Mm. And the dog took the same trip every day. And the uh, tea people understood that he shouldn't be bothered with. And our dog chased cars. Was it Jenny? And. Uh, that was terrible because we knew she was going to get hurt. And we, finally, a car squashed her leg, and she was uh, laid up for a while with a somewhat broken leg. And I thought, well, she won't chase cars anymore. But she did. But she didn't. What she wouldn't do is go to the intersection of Carlton and uh, Ivy Street anymore, which is. So she had learned something, <laughs> but it wasn't the right thing. I'm not sure I answered your Thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, um, so in the case where um, she learns whether digging dirt is a good or bad activity is when there's somebody with, uh, that, with whom she has an attachment bond with present who's telling her whether it's good or bad. And in the case where she learns to avoid that spot is when something bad happens to her in the spot. So in a sense, the, the dog is behaving just like that logic. Yes, the dog. Except that the dog is oriented toward location rather than something else. So, uh, about a possible hierarchy of higher order representation schemes of knowledge, with like um, uh, semantic nets on top and at the bottom. So there's like you're left in the middle of KYs and on the bottom there's something separate. Um, so the way I thought about the questions that were just asked for that humans, <laughs> it's just natural to me that you need all the intermediate um, representations in order to support like something like semantic nets. And it's just natural to me to think that humans have all of these, uh, high, the whole hierarchy of, of representations, but dogs might have something um, only in the middle, like they have, <coughs> they have something that like neural nets or something. Um, so my question is, what behaviors that you could observe in real life um, could only be done with one of these intermediate representations of knowledge um, that can't be done with something like machine learning? Hmm. 
You mean machine learning of what, of some particular kind? The kind that's currently fashionable, I think. <coughs> kind of brute, like with like shoot a data set brute force sort of uh, calibration of some parameter. Hmm. So it seems to me that if you were to recognize a behavior like that, it might be a worthy intermediate goal to be able to model that instead of trying to model something like natural language, which mm -hmm. is you might need the first part to get the second part. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be nice to know. I wonder how much is known about elephants, which are awfully smart compared to I suspect that they are very good at making plans because it's so easy for an elephant to make a fatal mistake. So unfortunately, it probably uh, nobody, no research group has enough budget to, to study that kind of animal because it's just too expensive. How smart are elephants, anybody? I've never interacted with one. I'm not sure if you have a question. I mean, the, the question is, are there behaviors that you, you need an intermediate level of the repetition of knowledge in order to perform that uh, <coughs> you don't need like the highest level, like the semantic, like, like basically natural language art to do? So you could say that if I saw an animal doing this behavior, I know that it has some intermediate level of uh, representation of knowledge that's more than kind of a brute force machine learning approach. Mm -hmm. Because like, like was discussed before, a computer can do pathfinding and, uh, with just like a brute force approach, but I don't think that's how humans do it or animals do it. Well, I can't think of a good ex It's just hard to think of any animals besides us that have really elaborate semantic networks. There's Coco, who is a gorilla that apparently had hundreds of words. But uh, I think the question is to find something lower than words. Like maybe Betty the Crow and her. With that stick. Yeah. How many of you seen the Crow movie? She, she bends the, she has a wire that she bends yep. and pulls something out of a tube. But, uh, I don't think machine learning can do that, but I don't think you need semantic math either. I have a parrot who lives in a three dimensional cage and she knows how to get from any place to another. And if she's in a hurry, she'll find a new way uh, <coughs> at the risk of injuring a wing because there are a lot of sticks in the way. So flying is risky. But, uh, our, our daughter, Julie, once visited Coco, the gorilla, and uh, she was introduced, Coco's in a cage. And uh, Penny, who is Coco's owner, introduces Julie in sign language. Coco, it's not words, it, I'm, it's not uh, spoken, it's sign language. And uh, so Julie gets some name and She's introduced to Coco, and Coco <coughs> likes Julie. So Coco says, let me out. And Penny says, no, you can't get out. And Coco says, then let Julie in. And I thought that showed some fairly abstract reasoning or representation. Uh, and Penny didn't 
red coat led Julie in. But uh, Coco seemed to have a, a fair amount of, of uh, declarative syntax. I don't know if she could do passives or anything like that. If you're interested, you probably can look it up on the web. Uh, <coughs> Penny's owner, I mean Penny, Penny thought that Coco knew six or seven hundred words. And a friend of ours was a teenager who worked for her. And uh, what's his name? Uh, and he was convinced that, uh, that Coco knew more than a thousand words. But he said, you see, I'm a teenager and I'm still good at picking up gestures and clues better than the adults here. But uh, anyway, I gather Coco is still there, and I don't know if she's still learning more words. But every now and then we get a letter asking to send more money. Oh, in the last lecture, I couldn't think of a the right cryptarithmetic crypto example. I think that's the one that the new old Simon book starts out with. So obviously M is one and then I bet some of you could figure that out in four or five minutes. Has anybody figured it out yet? <laughs> Help. Send more questions. Yeah. So, uh, I have an example of, for instance, I go out to a restaurant of this and of this type of exotic food that I've never ever had before, and I end up getting sick from it. So, what determines whether um, what I learn from this? Because there are many different possibilities here. There's the one possibility of I learn to avoid the, the specific food I ate. Another possibility is like. I learn to avoid that type of food because it might contain some sort of spice that I react to badly. And the third possibility, there might be more, is like I learn to avoid that <coughs> restaurant because that just might be a bad restaurant. So in this case, it's not entirely clear which one I <coughs> ought to pick. Um, and of course, maybe in real life, I, I might go there again and empirically try another food or try the same food at a different restaurant. But what do you think about this in that scenario? What causes people to pick which one? The trouble is we keep thinking of ourselves as people. And what you really should, you should think of yourself as a sort of Petri dish with uh, a trillion bacteria in it. And it's really not important to you what you eat, but your intestinal bacteria are the ones who are really going to suffer because they're not used to anything new. So. I don't know what conclusion to draw from that. But there seems to be much difference. Like um, David Hume uh, thought that knowledge might be represented as uh, associations. And uh, that occurs to me as being similar to sort of like a wiki structure where uh, entries have tags. So um, uh, an entry might be defined by what tags it has or what associations it has. I'm wondering if. That structure has been, uh, somebody has attempted to code that into some kind of uh, virtual structure. Has there been any success <coughs> with uh, putting that idea into a potential AI? <coughs> I don't know how to answer that.
Do any psychologists use semantic networks as representations? Pat, do you know? Has anybody, and I know, <clears throat> is anyone building an AI system with, with semantic representations or semantic networks anymore? Or is it all, everything I've seen has gone probabilistic in the last few years. Your, your project, do you have any competitors? Any idea what the, um, the IBM people are using? I saw a long article that I didn't read yet. But but traditional information retrieval plus 100 hacks plus machine learning. They seem to have a whole <coughs> lot of different, slightly different representations that they switch among. But. Well, they probably have, I don't know, does anybody know what the answer is, but they must have little frame-like things yeah. for, the for the standard questions. Of course, the thing doesn't answer any, it doesn't do any reasoning, as far as you can tell. Right. So it's, uh, it's trying to match sentences in the database with the question. But, <clears throat> Well, what's your theory of why there aren't other groups working on what we used to and you are? Well, those are computing is a bad. And if you can do better in less time that way than figuring out, figuring out how it really works, then that's what you do. I mean, no, one, no, one, no one does research on chess. No one does any research on how Humans might play chess because the bulldozer computers have won. Right. There were there were some articles on chess and checkers early in the game, but nothing recent as far as I know. So it's a local in many ways it's a local maximum phenomenon. The bulldozer computing stuff has got up to on a certain local maxima until you can do better than that some other way, but we're too tested. Well, I wonder if we could invent a new TV show where the questions are interesting. <laughs> like, I'm obsessed with the question of why you can pull something with a string, but you can't push it. And in fact, what was this? We had a student who actually did something with that a long time ago, but I've lost track of him. <coughs> but how could you make a TV? How could you make a TV show that had common sense questions rather than ones about sports and actors? It's hard to explain that in it words. Buckles. It's easy to imagine. Yeah, so you can simulate it. Yeah. <coughs> well, can you? Yeah. So I have a question. So suppose in the future we can create a robot which is as intelligent as human, as smart, and how we should evaluate it? When do we know that we reach like certain things, like which test it should pass or which <coughs> test it should, um, I don't know. So for example, Watson, right? It can answer pretty um, hard questions and seem to be intelligent, but what, what all it is doing is doing some algorithms and then calculating pro some probabilities and stuff. Humans don't do that. They try to understand the questions and they look for the answer, right? But then suppose you can create a robot that can behave as it is like, I don't know, how would you evaluate? Like, when do you know that you reach something? That's sort of funny because uh, because you, if it's any good, you wouldn't you wouldn't have that question. You'd you'd say, well, what can't it do, and why not? And you'd argue with it. In other words, people. 
people talk about passing the Turing test or whatever, and uh, it's hard to imagine a machine that, uh, <clears throat> that you converse with for a while and uh, then when you're told it's a machine, you, you're surprised. Well, I would ask you questions like, uh, why can't you push something with a string? And, uh, well, anyone have a Google working? What, what does Google say if you ask it that? Maybe, maybe it'll quote me. Or, or someone who's, yeah. I'd say, well, it would buckle. And then they would say, what do you mean by buckle? And then I'd say, oh, it would fold up so that it got shorter without exerting any force at the end, or blah, blah. I don't know. There are lots of answers. How would you answer it? A, uh, a physicist might say, if you got it really very, very, very straight, you could push it with a string. But quantum mechanics would say you can't. Yeah. Um, I feel like they do, like the typical or like an interesting show would be have like an alternate cookie show or something where you have to use objects that's like not normally um, found to have that use. So like you want to be in a room. That's interesting. When I was in graduate school, I took a course in knot theory. And in fact, you couldn't talk about them. And if anybody had a question, they'd have to run up to the board and, you know, they'd have to do something like this. <coughs> Is that a knot? No. No, that's just a loop. Or is, but if you were restricted to words, <laughs> it would take a half hour to. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. You mentioned solving the string puzzle by imagining the result, and I think I heard someone else say computers can do that in some way. You can simulate a string, and we know enough physics that you could give a reasonable approximation of the string. But I find that uh, the, the question that is often not asked in AI is, or by computers, is how does one choose the correct model with which to answer questions? There's a lot of questions we're really good at answering with computers, and some of them you know, genetic algorithms are good for, some of them basic statistics, some of them formal logic, some of them physics simulation. But this is all, to me, this is the core question, because this is what people decide, and no one seems to have ever, ever tackled an AI. Well, for instance, you have to, if somebody asks the question, you have to make up a biography of that person, so that, because the same question from different people would get really different answers. Why does a kettle make a noise when 
the water boils. Uh, if you know that the other person is a physicist, <clears throat> and it's easy to think of things to say, but <laughs> not, a very, not a very good example. What, what's the context of that? How do you, in a human conversation, how does each person know what to say next? I guess, you know, one question is, how do people decide what AI methods to use to tackle a problem? And I guess the more fundamental question is, when people are solving problems, how do they decide how they're going to think about the problem? Are they going to think about it by visualizing it, think about it by trying different things, think about it by analogy or formal logic? Of, of all the tools we have, why do we pick the ones we do? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that goes back to the, <coughs> if you make a list of the 50 most common ways to think, uh, and somebody asks you a question, uh, or asks why does such and such happen, uh, how do you decide which of your ways to think about it? And I suspect that uh, That's another knowledge base. So we have common sense knowledge about, you know, if you let go of an object, it will fall. And then we have um, more general knowledge about what happens when an object falls. Why didn't it break? Well, it actually did, because here's a little little white thing, which turned into dust. And so that's why I think you need to have five or six or how many different levels of representation. So uh, as soon as somebody asks a question, one part of your brain is coming up with, a, with your first idea. Another part of your brain is saying, is this a question about physics or philosophy, or uh, is it a social question? Uh, did this person ask it because they actually want to know, or they want to trap me, or? Um, so I think you, generally this idea of this, there must be many kinds of society of mind models that people have, and each person, whenever you're talking to somebody, you're, you have some, you choose some model of what is this conversation about? Am I trying to accomplish something by this discussion? Am I, is it really an interesting question? Uh, do I not want to offend with the person, or do I want to make him go away forever? Or, little parts of your brain are making all these decisions for you. I'd like to introduce Bob Lawler, who's visiting. One of my favorite stories, uh, one of my favorite stories about Feynman was, uh, comes from uh, asking him at dinner one night. Uh, I asked him how he got to be so smart. And, <laughs> and he said that uh, when, when he was an undergraduate here, he, uh, you know, he would consider every uh, time he was able to solve a problem, just the beginning step of how to exploit that. And what he would then do would be to try to reformulate the problem in as different, many different representations as he could, and then use his solution of the first problem as a guide in working out alternate representations and procedures in that. The consequence according to him, was that he became very good at knowing which was the most fit representation to use in solving any particular problem that he encountered. And he said that that's where his legendary <coughs> capability of being so quick with good solutions and good methods, the solutions came from. <coughs> so maybe a, a criteria for an intelligent machine would be one that had a number of 15 different ways of thinking, and applied them regularly to develop alternative 
information about uh, different methods of problem solving. You would expect it then to be have some facility at choosing based on its experience. Yeah, he wrote something about because the other physicists would argue about whether to use Heisenberg matrices or Schrodinger's equation, and he thought he was the only one who uh, knew how to solve each problem both ways, because most of the other physicists would get very good at one or the other. He had another feature, which was that if you argued with him, uh, sometimes he would say, oh, you're right, I was wrong. Like he was once arguing with Fredkin about could you have clocks all over the universe that were synchronized? And uh, the standard idea is you couldn't because of relativity. And Fredkin said, well, suppose you start out on Earth and you send a huge army of little bacteria sized clocks and send them through all possible routes to every place and uh, figure out and compensate for all the accelerations they had experienced on the path, then wouldn't you get a synchronous time everywhere? And Feynman said, uh, you're right, I was wrong, without blinking. He may have been wrong, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> more questions. Yes. Uh, so the thing must be that <coughs> if you have a problem, <coughs> how do you characterize it? How do you think, what kind of problem is this? And what method is good for that kind of problem? So I suppose that people vary a lot. and. That's a great question. Uh, that's what the critics do. They say, uh, what kind of problem is this? How do I recognize this particular predicament? And uh, I wish there were some psychologists who thought about that the way Newell and Simon did, God, in the 1960s, it's 50 years ago. How many of you have seen that book called Human Problem Solving? It's a big, thick book, and it's uh, got all sorts of chapters. That's the one I mentioned the other day, where they actually had some theories of human problem solving and simulated uh, this. They, give, they gave subjects problems like this and said, uh, 
we want you to figure out what numbers those are. And they lied to the subjects and said, this is an important kind of problem in cryptography. The, uh, the secret agents need to know how to uh, decode cryptograms of this sort, where uh, usually it's the other way around. The numbers stand for letters, and there's some complicated coding. But these are simple cases. So you have to figure out that sort of thing. And then the book is, uh, has various chapters on theories of how you recognize different kinds of problems and, and uh, select strategies. And of course, some people are better than others. And believe it or not, at MIT, there was a, almost a whole decade of psychologists here who were studying the psychology of five-person groups. It became, uh, <clears throat> suppose you take five people and put them in a room and give them problems like this, or not the same cryptic, but you know, little uh, puzzles that require some cleverness to solve. And uh, you record and video. They didn't have video in those days, so it was actual film. Yuck. And uh, there are many, there's a whole generation of publications about the social and and cognitive behavior of these little groups of people. They zeroed in on five-person groups for reasons I don't remember. But it turned out that almost always when you had that, the group divided into two competitive groups with two and three. And uh, every now and then they would reorganize. But it was more a study in social relations than in cognitive psychology. But. Uh, it's an interesting book, and I don't. There must be uh, contemporary studies like that of how people cooperate, but um, I just haven't been in that environment. Any of you taken a psychology course recently? Not a one. Just what hap Wonder what's happened to general psychology. I used to sit in on Toyber and a couple of other lecturers here. And a psychology course was, it was sort of like 20% optical illusions and well, yeah, they still do that. stuff like that. <laughs> they also concentrate a lot on uh, developmental psychology. Well, that's, that's yeah. nice to hear, because uh, I don't believe there was any of that in Teuber's class. Gabrielli now teaches the introductory psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and he do they still on. believe Piaget, or do they think, think that he was wrong? Uh, I think they probably take the same approach as with like Freud. They would say, you know, great ideas in a revolution, but they also don't think he's the end of the. Well, he got. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Piaget's later years, he got algebra envy. And uh, he wanted to be more scientific and studied logic and uh, a few things like that and became less scientific. It was sort of sad to, uh, I can imagine being browbeaten by mathematicians because they're the ones who were getting published. And he only had, how many books did Piaget? Incredible numbers. Uh, like, but if, if, if I may add a comment about Piaget here that uh, really comes from uh, an old friend of many of us, uh, Seymour. As you know, he was, of course, Piaget's mathematician for many years. We got Papert from Piaget's lab. But uh, Seymour said that he felt that Piaget's best work was his early work, especially Bill Graham's case studies. And one time when we were talking about the issue of focusing from the AI lab, the work done in psychology here, Seymour said he felt that was less necessary than more of a concentration on AI, because he expected in the future 
the, the world of study of the mind would separate into two individual studies. One much more biological, like the neurosciences of today, and the other focused more on the structure of knowledge and on representations and, in effect, the genetic epistemology of Piaget. Then he added that, uh, that's something that was a quote later in the was that uh, even if Piaget's marvelous theory of today proved to be wrong, he would sure that whatever replaced it would be his theory of the same sort, one of the development of knowledge and all its changes. So uh, I don't think people will get away from Piaget however much they want to. I don't think so either. <coughs> I meant to introduce our visitor here because Bob Lawler here has reproduced a good many of the kinds of studies that Piaget did in the 1930s and 40s. And if you look him up on the web, you'll, you must have a few papers. Actually, I, I better tell you what the website is because it's still hidden oh. from web pro. It's uh, nlcsa.net. That would be hard to. Natural. Learning Case Study Archive.net. It's still in process, still in development, but it's worth looking at now. How many children did Piaget have? Well, Piaget had three children so whose did development you. he studied. But uh, you know, what he did was to mix together the information from all three studies and supported the ideas with which he began. So it was illustrations of his uh, theories. Anyway, Bob has quite a lot of studies about how his children uh, developed concepts of number and geometry and things like that. And I don't know of anyone else since Piaget who's continue to do those sorts of experiments. There were, there were quite a lot <coughs> at Piaget's Institute in Geneva for some years after Piaget was gone, but I think it's pretty much closed now, hasn't it? Well, the, the last psychologist that Piaget hired was Jacques Lanesh, <coughs> who was no longer at the university. Uh, he retired, and uh, it has been taken over by the neo piagetians who are doing something different. Is there any other place? Well, there was, uh, oh, there, there, there are there was Yoichi's lab on yeah. children in there, Japan. There, there are many people who take Piaget seriously, and uh, in this country as well as others. So Robert mentioned that uh, Feynman had like more representations of the world than like usual people. The like when I talked about Einstein and the glia cells, I refer to that because I believe K lines is a way of representing the world, and maybe Einstein had like better ways of representing the world, and I believe that, for example, agents and resources are not different from Turing machines. You can create a very simple like Turing machine that act like agents and you have some mental states. But uh, there is no, I believe, good way of, uh, right now, of representing the world and like updating this representation of the world, like it seems to me that uh, <coughs> when you grow up, you're learning like how to represent the world better and better, and you have some layers, and that's all of K lines. And if if clear cells are actually like related to K lines, so it means that I still like had like a better hardware in representing the world, and that's why he would be smarter than other people. Well, it's hard to... <coughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm sure that that's right, that uh, you have a certain <clears throat> amount of hardware, but, but you can reconfigure some of it. Uh, <clears throat> nobody really knows, but some brain centers may have only a few neurons, and maybe if they're, uh, maybe there's some retrograde signals so that if two brain centers are, are simultaneously activated, uh, then uh, usually the signals only go one way from one to the other. Have to go through a third one to get back. But uh, it could be that the brain, uh, that the neurons have a property that if two centers are activated, maybe uh, that causes more connections to be made between them that can then be programmed more. I don't think anybody really has a clear idea of, of whether you can grow new connections between brain centers that, that are far apart. Does anybody know? Is there anything? Uh, you yeah, yeah. common knowledge that there was no such thing as adult neurogenesis, and now it is known that it exists in certain limited regions of the brain. So in the future, it may be known that it exists everywhere. Right, or else that the, those experiments were wrong, and, yeah. <clears throat> and they were in a frog rather than a person. take a frog's brain out and stick it in backwards and pretty soon it would be just like it used to. What Leffin said? Yeah. Of course. I don't know if he was kidding or not. You never could tell. You could, yes. never, could never tell when he was kidding. Leffin was a neuroscientist here who was sort of one of the great all-time neuroscientists. He was also one of the first scientists to use transistors for uh, biological purposes and made circuits that are still used in every laboratory. So he was a very colorful figure, and everyone should read some of his older papers. I don't, I don't know that there were any recent ones, but he had an army of students who, uh, <clears throat> and he was extremely funny. What else? Sort of, uh, continuing on the idea of hardware versus software, uh, what do you think about the idea that um, like intelligences or humans may need strong instincts uh, as when they're born in order, like, and the interplay between their instincts, like they know to cry when they're hungry or to look for their mother. And they need these instincts in order to develop um, higher orders of knowledge. You'd have to ask L. Ron Hubbard for th I don't recall any real s attempts to s I don't think I've ever run across any uh, buddy claiming to have correlations between prenatal experience and the development of intelligence. <clears throat> When, uh, before intelligence is really developed, like you learn language, before you learn language, you need to have a motivation to do something. So you need to have instinct, instinctual reactions to things. And by uh, accumulation of experiential knowledge, after you're born, you well, children learn language, you know, 12 to 18 months. And what are you saying that they need some preparation? I'm not sure what you're asking. So, take it from an engineering point of view. If you were to uh, build like a robot, would you need to program it with some instincts, uh, some like rule of thumb uh, algorithms 
in order to get started in the world, in order to build experiential knowledge. You might want to build something like a difference engine so that you can represent a goal and it will try to achieve it. So you need some engine for, for producing any behavior at all. Like, if you take the approach that, like, maybe to build an AI, you should build, like, a, like an infant robot, and then you teach it um, as you would, like, a human child, then would it be useful to make it dependent on, like, some mother figure in order to uh, help it learn how to do things like a human child would? Well, in order to learn, you have to learn from something. And one way to learn is is in isolation, just to have some, you could build a goal to, to predict what will happen. And the best way to predict, as Alan Kay put it once, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So you could make a, uh, or you could, or you could put a model of an adult in it to start with so that In other words, one way to make a very smart child is to copy its mother's brain into a little subbrain when it's born, and then it could learn from that instead of depending on anybody else. I'm not sure. It ha you have to start with something. Of course, humans as Bob mentioned, or someone mentioned, uh, a, if you take a human baby and isolate it, <coughs> it looks like it won't develop <coughs> language <coughs> by itself, because I don't know what because. But <laughs> In fact, I remember one of our children who had just learning to talk, and she said, something came up, and she said, what because is that? And do you remember? It took a while to get her to say why. So, so when she, she, she would come up and say, what because? And I, I would say, you're asking why did this? <laughs> After a long time, she got the hint, but. Why do all WH words start with WH? One of them doesn't. How? How? <laughs> Could you say, wow? <laughs> How? Is there a theory? Not that I know. It's a basic sound telling that you're making a query before you can do the rising inflection. It's interesting. Is it true in French? Quoi? Well, the, the land of the silent letter. It's... Anybody know what's the equivalent of w WH words in, a, in your native language? N. What? N. N? Yeah. In what? Yeah. Really? They all start with N? Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe the infants have an effect on something. Do questions in Turkish end with a rise? Yes. Yeah. Is it rising? Well, so um, only the only the WH questions. Um, okay, all questions end in a kind of an inflection, but normally you have a um, little kind of little word that you would put at the end of any sentence to make it into a question, uh -huh. except for the, the, the WH questions, which are standalone ones that right. don't need the... Yes, you think, this is expensive, and they don't need the WH if you do enough of that. So the question, is that in the brain at birth? Is this 
expensive, but you can say, how expensive is this without that branching explanation? <coughs> Where is the using a separate word, but you don't need that separate word if it's an EN word? Hmm. But, but if you say, how expensive is this without the question of collection, it almost sounds like you're making a statement about just how ridiculously expensive it is. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you're going, how expensive, how expensive is this? Yes. Versus, <laughs> how expensive is this? Well, I should let you go.